and he first just played the few theme for us and played in, in the higher register of the piano. Oh, sorry, a quick warning. Um, have you noticed how humid it is lately? You probably notice that with thunderstorm warnings and tornado warnings about every other day, including this afternoon now, I guess. Uh, but at any rate, there are some good things about humidity and some bad things. One of the bad things about humidity is that they are just a nightmare for camps. Uh, and you're going to hear some very interesting sounds from Jerry today, which he has nothing to do with, because we have a number of notes on here where you're going to hear several notes when each key is played, because it's wild the other two. The last month has been just an absolute terror uh, for pianos. So if you hear really shocking things that don't sound like music at all, it's probably not there. <laughs> right? I mean, I can't guarantee it absolutely, but probably not there. I'll play the few things for us, Jerry, please. And play it in a lower register, because you're going to hear it all over the place. Fugue themes are written to have a particular character, so you'll recognize them. I'm going to have Jerry play what's called the exposition, which is where the fugue theme is stated in the different voices. This is a three-voice fugue, so it will appear first in, it's the alto first? Yeah, it'll appear first in the alto voice, then it'll appear above that in the soprano voice, while the alto voice is going on with something else, and then there's a little break, isn't there? There's a bridge. And then the fugue will come into the bass voice, while the other two voices are doing other things. So can you just play the exposition for us? It will make the piece infinitely more interesting, and you'll understand what a mathematical genius Bach was. Because to figure out how all that is going to work out is really quite an undertaking. Because remember, Bach also wanted it to sound good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the tricky part. Uh, and the prelude I don't want to talk about is just very charming. You will enjoy it.
because it was probably based on a live improvisation where someone said, hey, George, write something. And so he sat down at the piano, and you get that sense when you hear the opening because it has a five-note motif, which is played twice, and then it goes to vamping chords in a very syncopated way to give you the background, and then he takes that melody that he introduced and he writes a piece just like on the spur of the moment. And it sounds like an improvisation. And the story is, and I don't know whether it's true, I've spent years trying to verify it, 
but it's a widely circulated story, was that he actually just did this at a sort of private gathering. And a music critic from the New York Times was there and had a wonderful ear and wrote down when he got home what Gershwin had played, showed it to Gershwin, and Gershwin looked at it and said, yeah, I guess that's what I played. <laughs> because, I mean, he didn't made it up on the spot. So that's the first movement, and it, it has the feel of improvisation. Um, second movement is greatly influenced by, by blues, and that's why he calls it blue melody. It's partly based on the blues, blues scale, um, and it has a kind of bluesy feel to it. It's just very lovely. And the third one is just simply wild. For the, for the pianist, it's terrifying. For the audience, it's kind of exciting. Um, but uh, the, the trick for the pianist is to get through it without hurting yourself. So the three preludes by Gershwin.
thing is that WC is world famous, it has been for a hundred years, as the first really important impressionistic composer. And WC hated the term, didn't consider himself an impressionistic composer, and was very annoyed about the whole thing, because impressionism, of course, is a term from painting. Uh, the impressionists were paintings like Renoir and Monet and so on. And there's those wonderful paintings that all the edges are kind of fluffy and it's not like photographically accurate. You get the impression, that's why it's called impressionism. You get a feeling about what it's all about. Well, whether Debussy liked the title or not, it's very appropriate. His music is very impressionistic because what he does is he creates a feeling, a kind of atmosphere. And this is just a wonderful example because I've never heard any other musical description of moonlight that is as beautiful as this one. And it's all based on a series of tricks. Uh, we could spend hours, don't, I'm not going to, but we could spend hours talking about the tricks that WC uses to create this amazing sense of fuzziness so you're not quite sure what's going on. But the big trick is that from the very first note of the piece to the very last note, he plays a game with you. And the game is called, what key are we actually in? <laughs> <laughs> and he opens, can you just play the opening for us? This is so famous, you'll recognize it. So, right there, we have this game beginning. Are we in D flat major, play D flat major chord? Oh. <laughs> or are we in, <laughs> in F minor? Okay, now he's going to go back and forth between those. What he did was very cleverly, in that opening, used the two notes that appear in both of those chords and left out the other note for the chord. And he plays that game all the way through the piece. He goes from one to the other. And if you think I'm exaggerating by saying all the way through, please play the passage right at the end, where he gives us a very clear D flat major chord and follows it immediately by an F minor chord. So uh, he, it's a constant trick, and it's just one of many, many tricks. Um, but we'll forget about the tricks, and just close your eyes, and you will see movement. <laughs>
See, I told you WT was wrong. It is impressionistic, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Uh, and he deserves that pay. Um, he was a, a contemporary of Franz Liszt, and they were very, very close friends. Um, and uh, he's a very different composer. His music is every bit as difficult as Liszt's music, but Liszt wrote his music not only to be difficult, but to sound difficult and to look difficult. He was the ultimate showman. Um, and he loved performing. He came alive when he was on the stage. Uh, Chopin was very reclusive. Uh, he didn't like performing at all. He was a wonderful teacher. Um, and he would give typically only one or maybe two recitals a year in Paris. Um, and I mean, it was, it was the news of the town when Chopin was actually going to play in public. Um, so his music is deeply profound and very difficult, but it often sounds like it's not nearly as hard as it is. But in the codas, which are the firestorms at the end, it always sounds as hard as it is. <laughs> this is my favorite of the four plots. <laughs>
treat. Jerry's going to play a fun piece for you at the end. Um, we were going to have this as an encore, and then I said, Jerry, it's so much fun. If you don't get an encore, you won't get my encore. So decided, this is the encore now. <laughs> this is a piece by Volcom, who is still alive. All these other guys are dead, but this one is still alive. But he is about 85 now, if I remember correctly. Um, he's uh, famous for a lot of his ragtime and jazz sort of arrangements. Um, but he was trained as a classical pianist. He's a virtuoso classical pianist, or was when he was younger. Um, but this piece is just absolutely in sort of ragtime two-step style, and it's just a hoot. And one of the main characteristics of ragtime is that you have a very, very steady beat going on to make it really clear what the beat is. And then you play all kinds of things in between the beats called syncopation. And it drives you crazy because you never know where these things are going to pop up. And it really drives the pianist crazy because your one hand is playing absolutely strictly with the beat, and the other hand is doing obscene things all over the place. <laughs> and you're looking at like, what did that happen? <laughs> so anyway, uh, this is Balkan's rag, uh, Old Adam.